Brother Kenneth asked me to uh, do something on the history of street preaching, which um, is rather extensive. And he said, you'll have 30 minutes to do the history of street preaching, so please, at the end of this, don't come up to me and say, you know, brother, you forgot this guy and you forgot that guy. Hey, 30 minutes is all we have. So I, I know I've had to leave some of them out, uh, just bringing some of the highlights in, uh, but you'll get the idea that there is a history of what we're doing. We're not just a bunch of uh, fanatics that 20 years ago decided to start doing this. This is normal Christianity, and that's what we need to understand. So the history of street preaching, you're all familiar with this. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this uh, quote from Spurgeon, who was a street preacher, and he said this, no sort of defense is needed for preaching out of doors, but it would need very potent arguments to prove that a man hath done his duty who has never preached beyond the walls of his meeting house. More defense is required for services within buildings than for worship outside of them. And if you've noticed that as you've read through your Bible, uh, they're not holding, uh, you know, three-day revival meetings at the local ta tabernacle or what have you. These are people many times that are simply wherever they are and wherever the crowd is, that's where they preach. So with that in mind, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this. Father, we thank you again for the meal that you provided. Thank you for the nourishment that we have. Lord, pray and thank you for the spiritual nourishment. Pray that you'd bless this segment of the, of the meeting. And Lord, help us to uh, just understand uh, that what we're doing is nothing new. It might be new to people around us, but this is nothing new. This is scriptural. This is biblical. And uh, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be part of this. In Christ's name, amen. Whitfield was another great preacher, and he said this, I believe I never was more acceptable to my master than when I was standing to teach those hearers in the open fields. And we know from history that many of these fellows uh, began preaching in the fields. They were called field preachers. And again, you go through your Bible, and you see individuals that uh, could have only preached in the open air, Enoch being one of them, uh, his message is that the Lord is going to execute judgment upon all to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. What an ungodly message. <laughs> but that's the way Enoch preached and we know the crowd he preached to. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And if the ark wasn't finished, he must have been preaching on the pile of wood that was out there that they're, while they were building it. And the crowd, I would imagine, would come by and say, what are you doing? And he would begin to preach. And then you have Elijah. Ahab sent on all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. And they were going to have a contest. So Ahab said, let's all gather at Mount Carmel. Not Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Mount Carmel. There they are standing at the mountain. And Elijah came on all the people and said, and you know how that goes. Isaiah was the one that said, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their uh, transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. Jeremiah, we know, was a preacher that preached at the gates. And um, again, I know most of you are familiar with this. There may be some of you that are not familiar with it, but the gates uh, was where the people met. Uh, that was the main uh, area of, uh, of concourse was at the gates. And so Jeremiah preached at the gates, and he preached at the gates of the temple, and he preached in uh, the city of Jerusalem. Read through the book of Jeremiah sometime. This is, this is the street preacher. This is the guy that went all over the city, all over the place, and preached. Amos, they hate him because he rebuked in the gate. Jonah, Jonah went into Nineveh. What church did he go to? Did he rent the convention center? Nineveh was a big city. He walked in there and he began to preach. A three days journey to get across Nineveh. But his preaching was so dramatic and so powerful that by the end of the first day, word was getting around. Everybody was getting it. John the Baptist. He came preaching in the wilderness. Repent. The Lord Jesus Christ. This is a great statement. In all the four Gospels, we find him working with large crowds that followed him. And how do you communicate to large crowds but raise your voice so they can hear you? Uh, here are a few examples in the Gospels where he ministered with the multitudes. And again, now uh, one would speak to the multitudes without raising their voice. So Jesus had to raise his voice. Now, I understand Matthew chapter 12 says, you know, speaks about him not, uh, uh, it sounds like it's saying he's not raising his voice, he's not going to tread on anything or anything like that. I believe that's a reference 
to his first coming compared to his second coming. Because when he comes the second time, if you read that passage in Isaiah and it talks about the voice, then it's thundering. Uh, then, it's, then it's incredibly loud and, and he's coming back. You know how he's coming back. So you compare his first coming with the second coming and that's, that's the idea there. But he had to raise his voice. In fact, in uh, John chapter 7 when he's in the temple, it says in the last day, the great day of the feast, uh, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst. So to preach to that crowd and to preach to the people, he had to raise his voice. The Apostle Paul, Paul's a great example. He's our example. He said, the, the things you've seen and heard and, and heard about me and watched me do, he said, he said that's what I want you to do. And uh, Acts 17, 17, Paul was one that disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So Paul was in the market. He was preaching to the people there. Then you have the New Testament saints, and we'll take it from about 70 AD to about 400, 400 being the cutoff, uh, because that's when Constantine is pretty much getting in there and things are changing, it's becoming legal. But Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the gospel. That was the, again, the norm for the New Testament church. Wherever they went, they preached. These people, by the way, are the ones that suffered under the hands of the Apostle Paul. Uh, not the Apostle Paul, under Saul before he became the Apostle Paul. And they had been persecuted. And so because of that they scattered, but they didn't scatter with bitterness in their heart. They lived, still loved the Lord Jesus Christ even though there was trouble. And everywhere they went they preached about Him. Amen. But the zeal would diminish during Constantine because he made it legal. He legalized Christianity. I'm thankful I'm in America. But I know this, because it's legal, we, uh, we've lost the zeal. We don't have the zeal that Christians have in countries where it is illegal. And that's, that's a sad thing. Um, and then, of course, under Constantine, the church is falling into Catholicism, and there's corruption. And eventually the saints are going to have to uh, rebuke the Catholic heresy which is going to bring persecution again. And so you had the faithfulness of groups like the Paulicians, the Bogomiles, Cathari, Montanus, Donatus, Albigenses, and other groups like that, which the Catholic historians have smeared these groups. Uh, but those that, uh, and, and again, there's, there's not that much we know about them because the Catholics destroyed their works, destroyed their literature and all that. But there are glimpses into their history. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute. These, these people weren't really heretics other than the fact they preached the gospel and they believed a Bible. Patrick. I finally this year wrote my track on Patrick for St. Patrick's Day. I did some research in there. And uh, Patrick was incredible. Uh, he be, uh, Ireland became known as the Isle of Saints and Scholars. For more than 600 years, Irish missionaries carried the gospel with the same truthfulness as Patrick's to Britain, Germany, France, Switzerland, Italy, and beyond. For example, Columba and his companions set out for Scotland in 563. Columbus, uh, Columbanus and his companions went to evangelize France and Germany in 612. Uh, when's the last time you heard that about St. Patrick? He said, I thought all that guy was, was there for was to get the snakes out of Ireland and so he could drink green beer in March. No, that's, that's not what Patrick was about. He was an incredible uh, evangelist, incredible minister uh, in Ireland. In 1631, the English Baptists discovered and subsequently corresponded with small communities of Baptists in Ireland and found them to be sound. It is believed that some of these churches had histories dating to the time of Patrick. Uh, many of them can substantiate and confirm their claims of such for nearly 1,100 years, which places them within 200 years of Patrick. He was quite a guy. And uh, he had an incredible work over there. But again, the Catholic Church destroyed uh, his history and destroyed the history of those churches there. So we really don't know that much about him. But what we do know is good. Raymond Lull, here's one of my favorites. Raymond Lull was, if I remember correctly, a Franciscan. And that leads into some questions there. The, 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 there are a couple groups, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, uh, that did some street preaching. But, you know, are they Catholic? Are they not Catholic or what have you? And uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But Raymond Lull, to me, is a hero in the fact that he, 
uh, wanted to travel to North Africa and evangelize in the streets of a Mohammedan town. His dream came true when he was in his 60s, when he traveled to Bougia in North Africa and found his way to a public place, stood up boldly and proclaimed the, in the Arabic language that Christianity is the only true faith. That's a hero to me. He went over to North Africa and he, and he went into a Muslim town and he basically said, you all have got it wrong. Muhammad was a false prophet. This is the truth. Well, they arrested him and they beat him up and did that and sent him back home. So in his 80s, he came forth into the open market, back to the same place, presented himself to the people as the same man who they once expelled from their town. And Lull stood before them and threatened them with divine wrath uh, if they still persisted in their errors. And that time they killed him. But by the time you're in your 80s, what have you lost? You know what, <laughs> what are you going to do for retirement? Well, I'm going to be a martyr. <laughs> so before Luther and the Protestant Reformation came along, the groundwork for the success or their success was laid by several groups that rose within the Catholic Church and questioned papal authority to the point of getting excommunicated. Uh, you had the Franciscans. Uh, you had the Dominicans. And again, they are uh, questioning the authority of the church. Henry of Lausanne, who was also known as Henry of Bruges, of Cluny, of Toulouse, of Le Mans, Le Mans and the, the deacon, sometimes referred to as Henry the monk, a French heresiarch, which means he was the founder of a heresy. The Catholics labeled him as a heretic. Uh, the final half of the 12th century, he began preaching around 1116, and he died in prison around 1148. But he was preaching publicly criticizing the Catholic Church. Peter of Bruges was a popular French religious teacher who's also called a heresiarch by the Roman Catholic Church because he criticized infant baptism, opposed the erecting of churches and the veneration of crosses, opposed the doctrine of transubstantiation, and denied the eff uh, efficacy of prayers for the dead. An angry mob killed him in or around the year 1131. Where do you think the mob found him? Then we have the Waldensians which we probably, probably the most famous of these groups. Uh, Peter Waldo, a wealthy merchant in Lyons, France in the 12th century. One day he asked a theologian what he should do to gain eternal life. He was answered with the words of Jesus to the rich young ruler. So, uh, so he would sell his possessions, give the money to the poor, and follow Christ. So Waldo took his, he took this literally, selling his business, giving away his wealth. And together with his followers, they traveled in twos, preaching in the streets, reading passages of scripture, which they translated uh, themselves into the common language. Language. So they were street preaching wherever they went in groups of two, which is always a good idea to go at least two. But then it says this, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, the Inquisition was originally launched against the Waldensians. That's how much effect they had. So just traveling through different towns and preaching on the street uh, had an incredible effect to the point where the Catholics said, we need to kill these guys. Then you had the Lollards, uh, Wycliffe, uh, his group, and the name means babblers, which will be by Saturday, <laughs> organized a band of traveling preachers, one of whom converted John Huss. His followers were called Lollers, traveled through England, preaching in the streets and marketplaces against the errors of popery. Made them very popular at the time. And then you have this guy, Savonarola, very interesting individual. Uh, a Dominican friar, Puritan fanatic, a moral dictator of the city of Florence uh, when the Medici were temporarily driven out in 1494, sent to Florence originally to, uh, a dozen years before, made a reputation of austerity and learning and became prior of the convent of St. Mark, uh, a visionary prophet, formidable, effective hellfire preacher, obsessed with human wickedness and convinced that the wrath of God was about to fall upon the earth. He detested practically every form of pleasure and relaxation. We probably wouldn't get along with this guy, but he was a great preacher, hellfire preacher. And uh, he, he would get a group of boys together that were street, uh, we'd call them street urchins or street kids or what have you that uh, caused trouble. He would organize them in a sacred military, marching through the streets, singing hymns, taking collections for the poor. And then uh, during the carnival time, uh, he'd have them go house to house. They would collect trinkets and cosmetics and luxury and obscene books, everything that they considered to be wicked. And they would have a huge bonfire called the Bonfire of the Vanities. So all the cosmetics and, you know, the stuff we all wear, or you all wear, and the, 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 uh, uh, all the trinkets and all the junk and everything, uh, one great big bonfire. In fact, it was, I believe one record said 30 feet tall. I mean, very, very big bonfire. That was Savonarola. John Huss, 
burned in 1415, but being infected with the leprosy of the Waldensians and having preached Wycliffe doctrine. So you think he preached on the street? If the Waldensians did, and he was a follower of that, I think he did, and uh, preached what Wycliffe preached. Then you have the Moravians. The Hussite movement uh, that was to become the Moravian Church was started by John Huss in early 15th century Bohemia in what is today the Czech Republic. He objected to some of the practices and doctrines of the Catholic Church. Specifically, he wanted a liturgy to be celebrated in Czech, in their own language, lay people to receive communion uh, in both kinds, married priests, and eliminating indulgences and in the idea of purgatory. Uh, since these actions predate the Protestant Reformation by a century, some historians claim the Arabian Church was the first Protestant church. And then you have the Reformation. And then you have a group called the Anabaptists. In the year of the 16th century Protestant Reformation in Europe spawned a number of radical reform groups, among them the Anabaptists. And these Christians regarded the Bible as their only rule of faith and life. Imagine that. Here's a group that we would say, you know, the Bible is our only, only rule on the matters of faith and practice. And because of their radical beliefs, the Anabaptists were persecuted by Protestants as well as Roman Catholics. John Wesley complained about them. You read Wesley's journey, journal, there's a few places where he complains about the Anabaptists. But they were out there and they were public. And that's the spread of the Anabaptists. You'll notice where the red circles are, where uh, the actual uh, centers of the movement and the, the shaded areas in red is, is uh, largely or densely populated by uh, those of Anabaptist belief. And in the other shaded areas was where it was spreading. So the word is spreading around and the, the preaching is spreading. And they're, again, they're not doing that with radio. They're not doing that with computer feeds. They're not doing that with television. They're, they're doing it simply by going out and communicating with other people, either preaching uh, publicly to groups or just taking it to individuals and telling the story. William Farrell, it said of him that he turned every stump and stone into a pulpit, every house, every street and marketplace into a church. George Weishart, or Weishart uh, not allowed to preach in the churches, and so he preached in the marketplaces and the fields. John Knox accompanied him on his preaching tour, sword in hand to protect him from violence. Boy, there's a thought. <laughs> I, remember, I was thinking about the brother this morning, talking about how big his brother is. I remember being on Beale Street and preaching with Jack Patterson. You can get incredibly bold when you're preaching with Jack Patterson. But that was Weishart or Weishart. Then John Knox. Knox was clearly a man of great courage. One man standing before Knox opened grave said, Here lies a man uh, who neither flattered nor feared any flesh. Spurgeon said I, that he himself had preached uh, uh, at Addlestone in Surrey under the far spreading boughs of an ancient oak beneath which John Knox is said to have proclaimed the gospel during his sojourn in England. Knox was a public preacher, a street preacher. And then you have John Bunyan. A hollow or grave, a gravel pit in Hunslow Heath sometimes served as a conventicle, and there is a dell near Hitchin where John Bunyan was wont to preach in perilous times. So he was preaching publicly. And then you have George Whitfield. He's probably the most well-known. And he said this, Finding the pulpits are denied me, and the poor colliers are ready to perish for lack of knowledge, I went to them and preached on a mount to upwards of 200 Blessed be God that the ice is now broken and have now taken the field. And that began much of the field preaching. And uh, they wouldn't accept him in the churches. And they wouldn't accept him in the churches because of what he is preaching. Wesley, he said, I'm well assured that I did far more good to my Lincolnshire parishioners by preaching three days on my father's tomb than I did by preaching three years in his pulpit. And they wouldn't let Wesley preach in the church. He went to his dad's uh, grave, stood on it, three days preached, and uh, quite a few people listened. But they listen to what he says here. Wesley said, To this day, field preaching is a cross to me, but I know my commission and see no other way of preaching the gospel to every creature. Now, you may be sitting out here this afternoon thinking, you know, there's a lot of these guys here, and you've heard, you know, you see the guys that are up here preaching and what have you, and you think, boy, they really love to go out and street preach and, and what have you. But you're sitting there thinking, I need to do this, but I really don't enjoy the idea of doing that. I'm really not excited about doing that. Well, remember what Wesley said. Wesley said, this thing for me is a cross. He said, this is, this is out of my box. He said, this is something, you know, I have to fight with everybody. But he did it. 
He did it. And I think what we need to understand is this, that your flesh hates what we're doing. When your flesh sees these banners, it cringes. Uh, when, you, when, when that bus stops and you get off the bus on Beale Street, your flesh is going to say, mm -hmm. But as soon as you hold that Bible up and open your mouth, you just told the flesh, shut your mouth. I'm here, we're going to do this by the grace of God. The Methodists, instrumental in America's second great awakening, typified by outdoor camp meetings in the 1800s, Jim McCready, Peter Cartwright, Lorenzo Dow. The Haldane brothers, great Baptist revival in Scotland was a result of field preaching, the Robert and James Haldane and Roland Hill, uh, one of the founders of the Religious Tract Society, an early advocate of vaccination. They were Anglicans but converted to Baptists when the established church forbade their field preaching. Robert and James left their business, sold their estate to devote their time to preaching the gospel. William Taylor, a Methodist, the California Conference, mid-1800s. Uh, although published in 1867, this article speaks to our generation. Mr. Taylor spoke about cultural refinement, secular education, the negative effects of immigration, <laughs> the apathy of the churches, and other topics that apply today. The book from which this chapter, and I took this from a, from a chapter, uh, is called Seven Years Street Preaching in San Francisco, California. And they didn't have the problems today. <laughs> William Carey, the father of modern missions, first missionary to India. Carey had little education, taught himself science and languages. He translated the Bible into 11 languages. He went to India and started uh, to preaching to large crowds that gathered in the streets of the brothel district. One of Carey's associates, Mr. Chamberlain, would go to the Ganges River where Hindus gathered and start an argument with one of the Brahmins. When the argument drew a crowd, he would preach to the assembled Hindus. That's a good tactic. I know, of, I know of street preachers that have gone out and one has said, look, you be this and I'll argue with you and we'll draw a crowd and then we'll just preach to them. Robert Flockhart, this guy is incredible. He said, you'll never get, to, uh, get at the ignorant and profligate mass without open air preaching. Right? Because they're not beating down the door Sunday morning to come into church. I mean, somebody, somebody said a long time ago, uh, the reason why the police have to go out and arrest criminals is because they're, the criminals aren't coming to the police station and saying, here I am. And the reason why we have to go out and preach to the, to the, to the crowd is because they're not going to come into the church and say, you know. So he says this, he said, I had to go to, the, to, to bonds imprisonment for doing what our master did, for he preached far oftener by the roadside, by the seaside, than in the synagogue. Every evening, in all weathers, and amid many persecutions, did this brave man continue to speak in the street for 43 years. John Weatherford, one of the most famous of the American colonists. Weatherford had suffered more persecution than most for his preaching, carrying scars to the grave. While in prison for preaching in 1773 in Chesterfield County, he had continued to preach to large crowds through the jail window. His hands extended through the bars. His extended hands proved a tempting target for knife-wheeled ruffians who slashed his hands. But he continued to preach. And it was Patrick Henry that got him out of jail. Charles Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers. Now that's good because here's a man that's known for being a pastor. He's known for pastoring that was a metropolitan uh, tabernacle church, Baptist church. And yet at the same time, he is a public preacher, an open air preacher. That's the balance. That's the balance. The gospel command is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, but so little obeyed that one imagined that it ran thus, go into your own place of worship and preach the gospel to the few creatures that will come inside. So <laughs> he's got the spirit of a street preacher. And then he said this, and, and I use this quote, I remember years ago, I used this quote, quote at a camp meeting up in northern Michigan because there were guys there, there were a couple guys there that called themselves revivalists. And I'm not sure what a revivalist is. There's evangelists, there's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Somewhere in there, there's a revivalist. And uh, their whole thing was, you know, we need revival in America. I agree. So I thought to be a help, I'm going to quote Spurgeon because everybody quotes Spurgeon. I don't care what church you go to, what, what uh, camp you're out of. Everybody seems to quote Spurgeon. So I thought I'd help him out. 
Spurgeon said it would be very easy to prove that revivals of religion have usually been accompanied, if not caused, by a considerable amount of preaching out of doors or in unusual places. I thought that would be, that would be a blessing. Uh, that went over like a lead balloon. We want revival, but Spurgeon says, let me tell you what has to come along with it. And they say, ah, we don't want to do that. I got to speed up here. There's one of the gospel oaks in England where these men preached out. That's about a thousand year old tree. D.L. Moody, he would preach on the courthouse steps to people that would go by. William Booth, the Salvation Army, uh, he said this, that uh, the, the reason for his success was open air operations. Uh, he said, you'll, there's no chance without open air work to do what he was doing. Uh, R.A. Torrey talked about open air meetings. He said they're good because they're portable. You can carry them around. Uh, you can go any place you want with them, start a, start a meeting. Now, I'm going to, these two, the last two here, I'm gonna, I want you to look at very closely. From what I understand, Billy Graham started as a street preacher. Amen. Proving that just because you preach on the street doesn't mean you can get stupid. Yep. So be careful. I'm a street preacher, nobody's going to, and you get yourself messed up. Horton, Bellevue, started as a street preacher in, at Stetson University in Florida. Did a great work at Bellevue, but it's not a sound fundamental work anymore. So you can preach on the street. It's no guarantee it's going to keep you from getting stupid. You know what I mean by getting stupid? Either compromising or becoming a heretic or believing dumb things. And then I'm going to put this one in here. Because I believe that Sutek, Gerald Sutek, was one of the greatest influence in this country in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, he was here for years before he went to Romania and into the Philippines. He's still doing that stuff in the Philippines. He's got a group of guys. I get his newsletter. Some of you get his newsletter. He has guys on the street. They're still preaching out there. But I believe Brother Sutek uh, was one of, one of now I'm saying one of them because don't come with me in the service and say, well, I think it was so-and-so. I, I, I believe he was one of the greatest influences for street preaching in this country, uh, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years. And we're thankful for Brother Sutek. So I passed out earlier uh, the timeline, basic, basic timeline, but that gives you an idea of what's been going on in church history. And understand this, the street preaching began in the Old Testament, carried through the Old Testament, carried through the New Testament believers, uh, carried through the church, uh, even when the church was under persecution. And many times they had to hide and they couldn't get out and, and really do it. But when they had the freedom, when they had the opportunity, they're out there preaching on the street and uh, should be continuing on into this day and age. Amen. Amen.